Hey everybody, I'm back. Sorry, I'm not a cartoon. Today, I'll be talking about ancient Egyptian mummification. And you may be asking yourself why I'm whispering. It's because I accidentally got stuck in one of the Egyptian tombs. But I'll persevere. Now I just hope I find the exit before the mummy does. Hi, I'm Professor Curtis. First, let's talk about what a mummy is. A mummy is a dead human or an animal whose soft tissue and organs have been removed in order to further preserve the body as long as it's kept in a dry and cold environment. In fact, mummification was actually started by accident. The first instance of mummification was likely due to the desert's limited rainfall and dry sands. The Egyptians saw this first accidental mummification and decided to re replicate it and eventually perfect it. Intentionally started around 2600 BC between the 4th and the 5th dynasty, this process continued to develop until the Roman period. However, they truly started to perfect the craft in the 18th to 20th dynasties in the New Kingdom era. Pharaohs like Tutankhamun were able to be exhumed and still held a fairly good, recognizable figure to what they might have looked like back in the day. Quality mummification depended on who was being mummified and how much they paid to be preserved. The more money and status they had, the better chances they had of surviving years of erosion. Now that we know the history behind mummification, let's get into the actual process of preservation. Now, step one had to do with removing all of the organs. A special priest would start by removing all organs which could decay easily except the heart. Anything that was wet in the body had to be left out to help with the preservation. The heart was left in the body and said to house the soul. Small cuts were made along the abdomen to remove the liver, intestines, stomach, and lungs. There were multiple ways to remove the brain, but a lot of people just stuck a big hook up their nose and got little bits of the tissue out one by one. Another way was to drill a hole in the back of the skull, shove a giant hook up there, spin it around a lot, and then the brain would come out that hole. Pretty disgusting. Yeah. Organs were then placed in canopic jars. Each organ that was removed was protected by one of the four sons of Horus. The human-headed Imseti was the guardian of the liver. The baboon-headed Happy looked after the lungs. The jackal-headed Dumatef was responsible for the stomach and the falcon-headed Queb Sinuf carried the intestines. Now on to step two, drying the body. Embalmers had to dry the rest of the body to further prevent any further decay. They did this by covering the body in nitron, a type of salt that, was ex that had exceptional drying properties. Nitron packets were placed inside the body as well as covered the entirety of the skin on the outside of the body. Even though no moisture had been left inside or outside the body, the process still yielded a recognizable human form. Sunken areas were stuffed with linen, and other materials like fake eyes, makeup, etc. were added to give the appearance of life. Look at those cool shades. Once the body had completely dried out, the nitron packets were taken out and the body was washed clean of any salt that remained. Now let's move on to step 3, wrapping the body. After the body was finally full and dry, they were wrapped in special linen to help keep the rest of the body intact. Sometimes these linens had prayers on them that would further protect the deceased in the afterlife. Now, let's move on to step four, funerary rituals. After the body was finally ready and fully intact, the deceased would be placed in the tomb that was usually already ready. Preparations for tombs began long before the person has died, accumulating all the materials, building the tomb, and other funerary practices had to take place before he could be placed in the tomb. As part of the funeral, priests performed religious rites at the tomb's entrance. The most important part of the ceremony was called the opening of the mouth. A priest touched various parts of the mummy with a special instrument to open these parts of the body to the senses enjoyed in life and needed in the afterlife. By touching the instrument to the mouth, the dead person could now speak and eat. He was now ready for the journey to the afterlife. The mummy was placed in his coffin or sarcophagus in the burial chamber and the entrance was eventually sealed up. Now that we've learned about the process of mummification, let's get into the idea of the art surrounding the afterlife.
Egyptian symbols that were included in the tombs of the actual pharaohs and on the bodies. Today, I'm only going to be showing you a couple of them because the study of them can get pretty complicated. The most well-known symbol to come out of ancient Egypt, the Ankh, represented eternal life itself. Many pharaohs hold this symbol or have it embedded in their coffin. The was scepter was the symbol of power in ancient Egypt and it also represented the dominion of gods. It also ensured that the king had a prosperous afterlife. The symbol was Osirian in nature and primarily associated with themes of regeneration and rebirth. The term Osirian we'll get to in a second. The cartouche was an obvious link and symbolism to the sun. It symbolizes protection against evil spirits in this life and the afterlife. It also acts as a name tag for the pharaoh. Archaeologists like me have been able to see these on the front of tombs and identify who was buried here and when. The Ba symbol was the heavenly spirit and the human personality in the spirit world, because it always presented in the form of a bird with a human head with the features of the pharaoh that had recently died. Now that we've learned about different ancient symbols, the history, and the process of mummification, let's dive into the underworld and meet some of the Egyptian gods that are related to the process of mummification and the afterlife. Anubis was the jackal-headed god that was said to look over the embalming process as well as lead the deceased pharaoh into the journey of the afterlife. In modern society, Anubis is wrongly characterized as the bad guy in a lot of situations, when really he's just leading the pharaoh through the afterlife. It's like if your dog led you through the afterlife. He was a god that ultimately guided the pharaoh to safety. Osiris was said to be the first mummy in Egyptian mythology. He was the god of the underworld and the final judgment a person's spirit would receive after death. If he thought that they had led a good life, he would grant them into the field of reeds. But if they did not live a good life, then they would be devoured by Amit, who we'll get to in a second. This is what I meant when I said the Jejed symbol was Osirian in nature. Mat was the goddess of justice, truth, order, and balance. The Egyptians were keen on the order of balance and valued her judgments to be sacred. She is usually depicted with ostrich feathers or wings. In the afterlife, the deceased heart would be weighed against her feather. Feather represented truth and justice. Amit is the beast associated with the deceased time of judgment. She is seen in many different books of the dead, and is usually seen with a crocodile head, a lion's chest, and the legs of a hippo. If a person's heart was not balanced, she would devour their soul and subject them to oblivion. It would cease to exist. We've had a meet and greet with the Egyptian gods, let's talk more about the art that was placed in the burial tombs. This is an example of the Book of the Dead. It's a mural slash scroll that pharaohs would put in their tomb. This particular combination of scenes depicts Hunefer, the pharaoh of the 19th century. It shows him in the presence of different gods and goddesses being judged in the afterlife, as ones that we talked about earlier. As I mentioned previously, art was put in the tomb, as well as on the wall in hieroglyphics. However, not all of it was hieroglyphics. Pieces like these were found on the wall. Ducks were another symbol of life and regeneration in ancient Egypt. For Egyptians, the highest honor they could receive was to die. And no, it's not like they were obsessed with the morbidity of death, but on the contrary. They loved life so much that they wanted to be sure that they could experience the same pleasures on Earth in whatever afterlife awaited them after death. There was a large culture surrounding mummification and the process in which it happened. Special priests had to deal with the actual process as well as performing actual autopsies, so they had to be well versed in things like human anatomy, as well as any chemical reactions that happened within the body. This means that the people who embalmed the deceased must have been well educated in their society. Egyptians believed that the mummified body was the home for the soul or the spirit. If the body was destroyed, the spirit might be lost. The idea of spirit was complex and involved three spirits, the Ka, the Ba, and the Ak. Though we've talked about going into the afterlife, sometimes entering into the afterlife was not always guaranteed. As we saw in the Book of the Dead, some people had to weigh their hearts in order to see if they could actually get into the afterlife and see if they were worthy. But before they could get their heart weighs and granted access to the field of reeds, they had to undergo a perilous journey through the underworld. Well, this has certainly been another adventure, today we learned that mummification and funeral rites were largely important to the Egyptian people. Without these necessary steps, it was said that the deceased soul would roam the world in utter turmoil for the rest of eternity. The process of mummification is one of great technological efforts and religious meaning, and some methods of it are still used today to aid in the preservation of the body. Thanks for joining me and learning more about this fascinating part of Egyptian culture. I just have to find a way to get out of here. No! No! No!